Okay, Perry, <laughs> welcome to Cloud Conversations. I'm Thank very you. happy of uh, having you here. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, it's really nice to be here. <laughs> so uh, this is the first for our, uh, or this is a, a kind of different format. Normally I do this on Zoom. So uh, I was here at Cambridge and I said like, why not? And you were so uh, nice of saying yes of uh, being here. So uh, I'm really, really thankful. Uh, let me read uh, a bit about Kerry. So I don't know if I should read all of it. I'm just going to go all the way here, okay? Because, well, she has so many credentials and she has done so much. So uh, Dr. Kerry uh, Macareth, did, did I say this correct? Uh, Macareth, yeah. Macareth, yeah. Is a research associate at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence, where she researches anti-Asian racism and AI and Asian diasporic approaches to AI ethics. Previously, she was a Christina Gaw postdoctorate research in gender and technology at the University of Cambridge Center for Gender Studies. Her work uses feminism and critical race theory to examine how history of race and gender shape contemporary technologies with a specific focus on artificial intelligence. So her scholarship um, on this topic has, approved, has, been approved in, has appeared in journals such as Feminist Review and the Philosophy of Technology forthcoming. Uh, so you can imagine I'm a bit nervous, uh, but I'm very happy to have her here. So uh, I drafted a few questions as this normally goes. The first one is about you. Could you tell us a bit about yourself? Where are you from? What do you do with your free time? What are your hobbies, etc.? Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me here. And it's really nice to get the chance to chat to you. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yeah, so I'm Kerry uh, and I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand originally, but I've lived in the UK for about eight or nine years now. No, just eight, I think. Um, eight we years. kind of blur us together. Always in uh, Yes, always in Cambridge, actually, but I'm moving to London next year to do a visiting fellowship at UCL, so I'm quite excited nice. for a change of scene. I went to UCL um, for a bit. Oh, I didn't know that. I have some friends there. Cool. Yeah, oh, wonderful. I'll mm -hmm. get your tips then, and also yes. your London food tips. Yeah, right. Because if yeah. you like ramen, go to Oh, okay. Yeah. I will get, your, get all your tips, because yeah. yes, my main hobbies are cooking, eating, baking, reading cookbooks, yeah. <laughs> reading food stuff. books. So, yes, if you want Cambridge food tips, I'm also your person. Okay. Um, yes. But yes. So that's a lot of my spare time. Um, well, the next residential, I'll get some tips. Oh, uh, yes. No, I think uh, at the AI Masters, I think Maya, one of the course leads, shared a food list recommendation. So that mm. was from. Oh, that's <laughs> so nice. Yeah, yes. Nice. Uh, so that's my main contribution to the center that I work at. It's food tips. And then on the side, yeah. I have <laughs> 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 Relating to AI ethics. Mm -hmm. that's not what that's you mm -hmm. Oh, what do you go? Know? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, whatever. Yeah, I, I just watch videos and try to replicate. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and I try to more and more and they get better, a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But there we go. You're starting to ask me questions. <laughs> so Kerry has a, a podcast called The Good Robot Podcast with Eleanor, which uh, I introduced. Hi, Eleanor. Do you watch this? <laughs> And uh, and yeah, there's this like when you're the the guest, you want to invite ask questions, but let's 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 focus on the okay. on the list. Yeah, I think we could do this for like many hours. Yes, yeah. Like, also, now that we stand on food, I feel it's like okay, there we go. Let's follow one of That's good. Yeah. Let's focus on on, on AI. Okay. Yeah. So uh, about your academic trajectory. So what? Yeah, and this is a bit of a, a selfish question because I want to learn about how how to do this right. Like. Uh, so what key attitudes and strategies do you consider an academic has to develop like across time to make good progress on, on their field? No? And personally speaking, what, what has worked for you? Ooh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess, you know, I think I've been very lucky in that I've had a lot of like really great mentorship, a lot of people who guided me mm -hmm. through this process. I think trying to do this alone is very, very challenging. And I think, um, you know, I think one of the things that is really important is like getting a community quite early. Like I think especially mm -hmm. if you're um, a woman of color, if you're a family scholar, I think having people who you can trust, you can go to when you're facing any kind of challenge in the academy is just like super, super important. So I'm really grateful to those people like in my life. Um, who, are against, your who are your mentors? Oh, I've had a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the gender studies at UCL, Zain Yao has been really amazing. Um, mm -hmm. They're a critical race scholar and feminist scholar and the English faculty there. Um, and I've been really honored by the different ways that they've, um, yeah, curated different kinds of spaces to allow people to share their academic work, but also in a way that they don't have to leave themselves out of the room because I don't know if it's something you experience, but I feel like sometimes one of the challenges I've felt in academia is having to choose between kind of 
um, your sort of intellectual self, and, but and also the, or your personal self and the things that you're really passionate about. And I think for me, the most satisfying work is where I can bring those two things together. And so I think, yeah, when you have people and spaces that allow you to kind of be fully present. Be yourself that's, instead of. Exactly. Yeah, that's when the most beautiful, like, intellectual work happens. Nice. Yeah, right? That's great. Yeah. That's great, too. Yeah. Like, following what your, your true interests are, not just what is popular or what is happening there. Right? Yeah, definitely. And I think also, like, you know, if you can find like a narrative that is really compelling for you to keep following throughout your work, I think that's what makes you really interesting as a scholar and really mm -hmm. compelling to people. And like, I don't think that means you shouldn't have like lots of different interests because we okay. all, of course, we yeah. all have lots of interests. That's <laughs> what's fun about this. Um, but I think the more I think you don't end up in there, sorry, sorry. No, I think you don't end up in the AI if you have like just one interest. Yeah, and I right. think everyone like, here has. Like, wild interests, wow. you know, which is fun. Uh, I mean, I understand like 20% of what's happening at any given time at this AI center. And I'm just like, cool. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think, um, yeah, finding something that really works for you in terms of figuring out um, what kinds of stories you want to tell with your research going forward is important. I know that's going to be very vague and abstract sound. No, well, it's actually good. It's actually good. Like, uh, first of all, get, like, getting a community, people you trust, people that, you know, understand you. And then having kind of a connection throughout your work and your interests. Definitely. Very good. And it's something probably as well that you have developed a lot as a podcaster, which is kind of finding mm -hmm. a way to sort of tell stories about something, a core theme that you're really passionate about. And I guess for you, that's thinking about, you know, mm -hmm. how we know, what kinds of knowledge societies we build. So it's like, what, am I escaping the screen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's great. That's great advice. I mean, um, uh, I also have a lot to learn from you. Uh, from your podcast as well, because your podcast is much more academically rigorous than, than ours. But uh, we're, we're getting there. We're getting... <laughs> I mean... <laughs> more and more I know. I mean, I love the fact that so many academics now are moving into the podcasting space. I think it's something really valuable. And, and my partner, who previously worked in radio, is super passionate about trying to think about different kinds of communication and delivery. Because, like, journal articles, like, are great. I enjoy writing them. But mm -hmm. you can just reach so many more people with a podcast. Yeah, like, yeah. There's, um, it's kind of counter the ivory tower, right? Mm -hmm. But in a way, it also complements it. Like, yeah. even people that read deep technical, uh, scientific or philosophical papers could listen to a podcast from time to time. And then it might, an idea might come up, you know, a new mm -hmm. question might come up. Definitely. They're also great teaching tools and, like, something that Eleanor and I have found with the mm -hmm. robot is that often people will you know, say things in a slightly different way or they'll offer a new point of perspective on something than they do in their writing. And so that's really cool when you have a big scholar who you know they work really well and then they say something that you've actually never seen or heard them write before. Like, that's a really exciting thing to encounter. I mean, Eleanor encounters that more than me, though, because, like... <laughs> She's very well read, like amazingly so. Whereas I'm just wow. like, that's interesting. It's something that makes you really like a lot before. And I'm like, oh, nah, <laughs> it's I mean, not well read enough. I don't yeah. think you think that. I mean, you, you have a PhD that you're doing yeah. so much great work. I mean, but anyways, uh, and I apologize to the, the people that are listening to this because I have to go back and forth to the questions. But anyway, so uh, on to the next one. So how was your decision-making process uh, if there was one and how to, to land on AI and gender studies, how was, mm -hmm. walk us through like the decision, life decisions you had to make? Yeah. I mean, I think it was a lot of happy coincidences, which mm -hmm. is probably not as satisfying as saying that there was like, a really clear goal okay. in mind. I think it's probably more honest to like have a single, you know, yeah. exactly end up in this field. Um, so I come from a background um, from an undergrad in politics and IR. Um, and so I guess from I are, sorry. Uh, international relations, yeah, it's yeah, so very much a kind of art, social sciences background. Mm. Um, and I was really interested from the beginning in thinking about violence and political violence. And that's partly due to like my childhood. I grew up adjacent to the Sierra Leonean civil war. And so for a long time, I've been thinking wow. quite deeply and sort of intellectually and personally about, you know, what it means that to be her and that we hurt each other and how we grapple with that. Um, and then obviously, because that's very dark, very challenging, I think that brought me on to my second really core area of interest, which was probably what we might call the political imagination. So how do we think differently about the world that we live in? How do we bring about different kinds of alternatives? And so as part of that, I started looking a lot at science fiction because nice. I was really interested in fiction. Connected, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And forms of speculation outside of what we might normally call like a political text. Um, and so I did my undergraduate on 
teen dystopian fiction, trying to think about, you know, why do we try to escape into these really dark worlds in our spare time? Um, and then thinking wow. about what that means for like. Which ones did yeah. you take a look at? Um, I ended up doing a really teen eclectic dystopia. mixture okay. of things. I ended up looking at Bioshock, the video game, oh, oh, teen oh, fiction, yeah. but. It's um, fun, right? Like it's a great game. Yeah, yeah. Do you play games? Um, I, okay, I'm really lame. I'm super interested in gays, but I'm also incredibly cowardly. So I just like watch people's play. I really, really watch all Twitch, I imagine. That kind of thing, yeah, where I'm just like, oh, I'll play that. I don't know, I don't have time lately, but I really like Oh, okay. I love games. Very good, I know not to ask questions, but what games? Some context, and then we go and I'm going to be really brief. The last one I played is called Elden Ring. From uh, okay. Japanese design game design, the best in the world, yeah. Hidetaka Miyazaki. That game is gonna win game of the year. It's gonna yeah. get ten out of ten. It's gonna change. Uh, it's gonna. It, it already changed the industry. So so good. But we can talk about it. Okay. Later. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Um, but yeah. So yeah. I was one of them. Um, okay. Another one was also not a team book. So I don't really know if I just framed it in that way. Mm. Um, it's by New Zealand author, not as well known. This book called The Chimes, which is exquisitely written. She's, I think, a classical violinist. She's a musician. And the way that language is used, she uses like a lot of musical terminology and it's about memory control through the use of kind of like a giant organ. Uh, organ is the, the instrument, not organ, like a human oh, organ. Okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah. And like so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so that's just kind of really unusual, I think, narratively how it's told. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other ones, one was the Hunger Games because that was the like peak Hunger Games moment. Yeah, yeah, so that was based yeah. on on uh, yeah. Battle Royale, right? Like the Japanese novel. Oh, I didn't they, know they that. They kind of stole yeah. that idea. Yeah, it's actually a very creepy movie called it, the movie's called Battle Royale. Right. It's uh, it, uh, it, it, you know how it's, it often happens in Hollywood that they just take a, a, yeah. a great idea and they just. Remake it. Yeah, sorry. yeah, and I think that happened with um, I think the Matrix, right, was based on Ghost in the Shell. I think. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not playing sure. those cave, right? <laughs> that's a that's not plagiarism anymore. Yeah, a lot of things are stolen from Plato. Yeah. And, you know, and then you just you know. yeah, and so then I kind of ended up doing my masters on looking at domestic labor in science fiction. That's so the thesis called How to Be a Domestic Cyborg, trying to think about how race, gender, and labor intersect in films from like her by spike jones through to the television show humans um and so oh i i quite like that it. it's had a very oh, abrupt humans? it's yeah it's called humans um it's based on a swedish tv show called real humans i love the english language english version um yeah and so i think sadly i really like the first two seasons and i think sadly it kind of didn't have the the greatest kind of end or follow through mm. um but yeah it's an interesting concept if you're interested in things ai i will check it check out, it out. Mm -hmm. um and then sleep dealer by out of yeah fantastic film no, no, um, oh well. yeah no, that's What's it? a sleep dealer a sleep dealer yes yeah and so my um i'm sorry i didn't know my Warren wilcox recommended this to me and was mm. like yes it would be a really interesting kind of thinking through Drone warfare and colonialism across like the US Mexico border. And this is really fantastic. Wow. Yeah. I will so, check it out. Yeah, you should. Yeah. And how would you get out of that? I mean, did, did you get out of that too? Because cinema for me is so luring that I would also, <laughs> I was like, I, I'm just going to abandon everything and go into cinema. <laughs> but nah, you know? Yeah. It's really, really move on. Yeah, it's really interesting though, because when I was doing this thesis on science fiction, I had to spend a lot of time justifying to people and kind of politics and IR that these films have a lot of impact and how we think about technology and their political implications mm. but that was really was really interesting about moving into our ethics field and working with people like um dr kant Diha, dr stephen cave who works with ai narratives mm. thinking about actually we have a lot of evidence in this field that science fiction really deeply shapes how people think about technology and the products that they make and we saw this a lot in the industry partnership alan and i did with the big tech company um the way the engineers very frequently always referred to uh, their products or their mm -hmm. perceptions of technology through metaphors like the Terminator or Iron Man, like that they're really dominant cultural paradigms. But anyway, so I was doing this work. I ended up doing my PhD on something more related to political violence. It was a bit different, but I yeah. continued to be really interested in thinking about these AI narratives and the stories okay. that we tell about technology. So there's a book, yeah. a book came out, right? Like AI narratives? Yes, one book came out and Can another you? one's coming when out next year. Yeah. I think it's, year. it's like March or April 2023. So oh, AI I think it's called Imagining AI. So it it's based on the global AI narratives project. Okay. Um, yeah, I read about it. Yeah. I also read a report that was um, uh, co 
published with uh, CFI called Portrayals and Perceptions. Yes. Did you work on that? I did it. No, so that was done oh. my time. I was like, very excited to see that came out. That was right? very Yes, yeah. Um, I interned with you and woman um, like quite a few years ago, and mm. one of the projects I was looking at was very much around gender portrayals in the media and specifically like okay. representation on screen and how that affects gender norms. So I think work like this is the kind of thing I would have found really helpful at the time just to have these kind of wide scale studies that show, you know, we're actually working on one at the moment on portrayals of AI scientists on screen mm -hmm. and the gender disparities in that. And like these studies, they're quite low hanging fruit, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe proves something that we might intuitively feel is true. But yeah, just having that kind of data and that availability of that knowledge is like Amazing. very useful, I think. And what are you working on right now? This is off, I'm going off script. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think I've ever been on script. Yes. <laughs> Ask a question I'm like, so sorry. I did, I did warn you before. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> Great answers. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so I'm working on all sorts of different things. So you mentioned that earlier before we started, I think about, do you feel quite stretched thin? And I'm like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so at some point I need to say no to some projects, but the issue is they are all very interesting. Yes, um, I can imagine. Yeah. So Eleanor, who you interviewed and I, are working on a number of projects that we've sort of carried on from our last postdoc. So mm -hmm. one is actually a book based on the podcast. So that's book pretty fun. Wow. Yeah, so we, we've started to collect in now. We've been getting some of our guests. Robot. Um, we we think so. Uh, okay. we, I think it'll still be the good robot. We're still deciding on like a subtitle. Very um, nice yes. So I don't want to say it in case I like really put up because I'm like not quite sure what it is yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's we're getting some of our guests to write essays all responding to this provocation of what is good technology, which is what we ask everyone on the podcast, and then they're all answering in relation to the kind of phrase like good technology dot dot dot. So it mm -hmm. might be like good technology is free or like good technology incites resistance or yeah and so and they're all like 2000 word essays they're we're like they're accessible for academics we're working on making them as punchy and accessible generally as possible people. yeah because that's super important to us yes. sometimes philosophers can talk in ways that are not very accessible I'm, I'm, really, I'm really, equally I'm really guilty of that and so we're you know working on that um but yeah we're really excited the essays we've had so far have been fantastic um and it's really nice to kind of wow. see so something come out of the podcast I'm sorry day. the process the writing process is going to be like you're going to write a bunch of essays and then you're going to um, yes. Collect them together or like yeah. having a narrative or? Yeah, so we've kind of divided up all the essays into kind of a number of sections, right into like different areas of politics and society. Right. Um, but yeah, each of our contributors are sort of the individual authors of their essays, which have largely been based off the interviews that they did on the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, but then kind of just pulling together all the things that they said in the podcast into kind of a small bite sized here and essay instead. Um, nice. Yeah, and so I'm looking forward. I'm going to read it. Yeah, no, it's one to be really visual, really exciting, just mm -hmm. kind of like a very nerdy coffee table book that you can have if you just decide, actually, I want to know what's that is in Catherine Hale's thing, like technology as well. <laughs> These questions are, are getting more and more traction because mm -hmm. every company is becoming a tech company. So the AI is eventually going to start being used everywhere. Like, so uh, this is an exciting moment to, to talk about these issues. Yeah, I think it's a really crucial moment as well, because right. I think you're exactly right when you say like every company is becoming this tech company, which is there's so much kind of tech buy-in happening right now mm. within these companies um, in areas from HR, through the marketing, through the product development, that it's like actually we all need to be really literate in these questions and talking about it. It's not something that should just be isolated to just a legal way. That's super unfair. Yeah, 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 I completely agree. Mm -hmm. why it's great that folks like you are doing this at Efforts Masters, I think, because yes. it's bringing that knowledge into also the context. Yeah, yeah. 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 My, my, my plan is to, I mean, I want to do my, my PhD, but I also want to work with people that are, you know, engineers and doctors and, you know, uh, people in HR and lawyers that are, they're in the front lines, right? I think it's yeah. uh, something to do. And also doing this kind of outreach to, yeah. to everyone. Uh, okay, so moving on. Um, so I want to congratulate you on your PhD. I know you, you, you just finished it. Can you talk about uh, I mean, how was the experience? I mean, if you want to be brief, you can be brief. But yeah, I, 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 yeah. I didn't want to miss the opportunity to congratulate you here. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And no, I actually wrote up my PhD during COVID. So it mm -hmm. kind of hit and I ended up going back home to New Zealand for six months and writing up. So it was a very strange end to the PhD in a way. 
Um, I really feel for the PhDs who've been trying to do it during the pandemic. I think it can be a very isolating experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm really hoping that yeah. it's okay. And so definitely the advice I always give, I try and like go for coffee, like the first year PhD students. Um, and then my advice is always like, I would spend the first like, work block of your Monday just like scheduling lunch meetings mm. throughout the week scheduling wow. seeing people times because if you work on a very solo project and I did not in a lab you know it's a lot of time by yourself and I think it yeah. is you know some of the most valuable learning experiences are the ones you have in conversation but also just for your own health and happiness seeing mm -hmm. people's brain oh, on it's it. very so, important yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean I've felt I've been feeling this I mean mm -hmm. at a very minor scale but here mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I've met so, so, much, so many wonderful people, but the, on the residential week, but after that, like before and after, I was really lonely. I mean, mm -hmm. of course, I have the city, right? I can explore. But after a time, you go home at night and you're like, uh, yeah. and it kind of gets heavy, right? Definitely. Like, yeah, especially if you're the work that you're doing is quite emotionally heavy mm -hmm. as well. Like, I think it's the most incredible privilege just to be able to like sit and think for three years. Like, I was so lucky to be able to do that. But like, you know, I was working on things relating to incarceration and immigration detention. Wow. And, you know, it is, um, yeah, around political violence. And that work, I think, is really, really important. Um, but it's also like, it's quite, you know, difficult when you come back from a day of like reading, you know, women's testimonies of imprisonment in the archives. I've looked a lot at the incarceration of British suffragettes during uh, the early 20th century. Um, and like a lot of their testimonies are really emotionally difficult to read. And I think that's something yeah, that people, ways, eh? yeah, hadn't really prepared me for. And it's something the more that I talk to other researchers who do that kind of work, they're like, yeah, you know, there's a really big emotional element to that kind of research that we don't necessarily grapple with. You're going to cook. That's the secret. I mean, yeah, no, 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 yeah. And, and I mean, lockdown, I mean, double, right? The, the, the yeah, thing. yeah. No, I was very lucky to be with my family during lockdown, but you I should know, be very proud. Yeah. I was. You should, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah no, it's, it's amazing to have it done. And awesome. so if we, when you have HD or PhD, I'm definitely thinking of it as like, this is a project. It's not my life. It's not who I am. Like, I think to, I, I finished my PhD in quite a rush to start my job, and I'm so glad that I did that. So it was three years, approximately? Um, it was, yeah, exactly. Three three years because I was starting my postdoc so I had to finish wow. so I had a really hard deadline and then I had two or three days off and then I started so I was wow. like oh. <laughs> it's like, yeah. intense. like you have to fit I mean there's no options there's no other way yeah definitely but I'm glad that I did because it was just like it was a relief to have it oh, done um, so good yeah. <laughs> congratulations again so I mean, we we kind of responded to this one the, the, the good robot but yeah. could you tell me a bit about the experience of uh how did the good robot began and how has it been how long has it been going on and uh, what are your thoughts on it? yeah sure it's been going on for over a year now um which is really exciting we just hit fifteen thousand downloads which we're very happy about yes. um partly because i forced my friends to download it yeah. but also okay. we have some real <laughs> When if I find an authentic listener, I'm like, wow. Wow. How did they get there? <laughs> like, one of those. One of those. Five years, five years. Yeah. I'm going to put in all the links here so you can check out the... Uh, yeah. The, thank sure, you. Yeah. 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 Um, definitely check us out. <laughs> going to do some promo. Um, no, yeah. Of so we knew that public engagement was like a really important part of our gender and technology project that Eleanor and I was on, but we were also... Um, in the middle of the pandemic so we kind of were a little bit of a standstill because we were like well we know that a huge part of why this project was started was to try and communicate the ways that feminism can transform the tech industry the amazing stuff that's already happening through feminist activism mm. uh, and something we really wanted to do with our engagement was to try and walk the kind of middle ground between the kind of ai hype of like mm. silicon valley but also this kind of really intense techno pessimism which says, you know, that can turn into a kind of fatalism and says, well, you can't do anything about all this yeah, terrible stuff. Yeah, it that's paralyzes happening. everyone. It's just, yeah, I agree. Mm -mm. And so we were kind of like, okay, well, what can we do that will actually make people want to come? Because, like, no one wants to come to another Zoom seminar, like, let's be honest. <laughs> so we all, we all maxed out. This is, like, <laughs> September 2020 through to, like, January oh, 2020. Well, we were like, yeah. everyone else is done. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no one wants to think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No more platforms. Yeah, it's like no more online conferences. So then we kind of said, okay, well, actually, what about a podcast? Because Eleanor listens to a lot of podcasts. My mm. partner, as I mentioned, like 
work in radio and is just like always listening to a podcast. Um, mm-hmm. He's like that person, oh, like yeah, yeah, really it. It, yeah. yeah. And so nice. it's like actually this kind of works. Like you know, there's some really fantastic stuff out there, yeah. um, like your stuff, and like all sorts of academic podcasts that are going on. Um, and so then we struck this idea of the good robot because we were we thought it was quite provocative because a lot of work in our area is very critical, which is fantastic and. Um, I am the super pessimistic one of Eleanor and I. She's the slightly more optimistic yeah, one. Yeah, I am um, the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm only doing with the more exactly. Yeah, no, I always joke and say we'll have a consultancy just called like, don't do that. Like, <laughs> don't do that. Like, it's going to be like $200,000. Just yeah, don't do it. Yeah. No, it's a bad idea. Yeah. So, you know, we have a strong brand already. Um, but, you know, I like this idea of the good robot because it made me say, okay, well, it's very easy for us as, as feminists often to critique, but like, what does it mean to think differently about technology? Um, and also we like this idea of like the good robot because we wanted it to not be an assumption that we think technology can be good, but, you know, to be, I guess, um, yeah, just provocative to say, you know, well, actually, where do you stand on this idea of technology? What can do for us? Um, so about, about critiquing, I think it's, uh, many people can take it as bad as negative, but I think it's a good, it's a good thing. Like, um, Many famous philosophers have uh, like a, a destructive phase of like 20 or 30 years, and then they begin a constructing phase. So uh, keep going, <laughs> keep destroying, keep saying no. At one point, you're going to say like, okay, now I know, you know? Yeah. And- yeah, and I do, and I really fully believe in the power of like a no. Like, I think there's some technologies we just need to reject and be like, this just is pseudoscience, mm-hmm. like, it's this ridiculous. just is harmful. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like, prison abolition is really important to me. And I think there's a lot in kind of abolitionist thinking that's really important here as well, in terms of the importance of just fully rejecting mm-hmm. systems that are violent and technologies that are violent um, in favor of alternatives, which can actually be better. Um, but I also, yeah, I think, you know, you do sometimes just have to have that full on rejection before you start to build an alternative. Um, yeah, which is something that I've really enjoyed seeing the variety of guests on our podcast, because we have some who are like super critical, who are very much like, we just have to all get off social media. We need to be engaging totally differently. We need to be overthrowing global capitalism. Mm -hmm. All the way through to people who are within these companies who are trying to think about, oh, what does change look like from within these institutions? Um, and so that spectrum just really fascinates me. I and mean, I think how I feel on that spectrum changes day to day, which is probably is not me. a good thing, but yeah. it's the honest way that I feel. <laughs> yeah, the honest way, because, the, the, I mean, and that overwhelming, I think everyone feels it, like, especially this yeah. week on the Masters, like, yeah. it's so much happening so fast at like a hundred dimensions and and perspective and then one thousand perspectives mm-hmm. and you're like wow like how are we gonna do this but uh well, we have to figure it out like definitely that's why we're here yeah, yeah definitely and something I think that is really important to me is acknowledging that like different kinds of work can happen simultaneously like we can mm-hmm. be working to overthrow a violent exploitative system while also saying but we need to do some kind of immediate short term mm-hmm. help like right now like in parallel you know, exactly like in parallel not seeing them kind of as like one or the other but just mm-hmm. saying like this all somehow needs to happen at once and that's yeah. super challenging it is it is wow yeah. and especially with the way like how money works like how companies work and investment flows it's yeah. hard to stop you know like it's like mm-hmm. a flood of you know once the money comes in and someone says no it's like what <laughs> like, just tell me how I, i'll get a yes it's, it's very very difficult mm. so uh i have four ai questions uh, that perhaps you we could synthesize but yeah. uh i uh, i normally don't ask like get into this kind of things but uh, i would like to hear from you mm. and i would like to start doing this more often on our cloud conversation so the, the questions are what are your hopes for present ai what are your fears for present AI, then what are your hopes for future AI, and what are your fears mm. for future AI? Those are good questions. As I mentioned about being very pessimistic, I feel like my fears are many and okay. ginormous. The hopes are few. <laughs> But you can answer all of them. Yeah, you know, this is yeah. a provocation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess my hopes for kind of present AI development is that I think my hope is actually almost more in the fact that 
Um, I think we've seen like so much public mobilization around algorithmic injustice and so much more kind of public awareness of different kinds of surveillance techniques, different mm -hmm. kinds of products. And like, I think that has really radically changed from like um, five or 10 years ago. Um, you know, I think, yes, we've seen this huge growth in AI hype, but we've also seen this kind of growth in AI skepticism, which is really interesting. Okay. I don't think those people are necessarily always moving in the same circles, which is a bit of a worry. Mm -hmm. And of course, like you just mentioned, there's always like serious risk of corporate capture when it comes to AI ethics, when it comes to critical approaches to technologies. Mm -hmm. But I'm really, I am heartened by the fact that there is a lot more, I think, pushback both within companies and publicly. And I think, um, high level scandals like the A-level algorithm here in the UK. Um yes, they're massive Which scandal? Um the A-level algorithm. And uh, that was in 2020. Know. This was oh it wasn't 2020 or 2021. Okay. I can't exactly oh. remember the year, but it was Which uh, algorithm I couldn't get it. I think it was 2020. So basically they used um a predictive algorithm mm -hmm. with the UK government um because the students couldn't sit their exams because of covid and so they used machine learning algorithm or to predict what grades students they think would have gotten and then wow. um that became their grade now obviously there's like really big implications for you know students as university choices their careers going forward i'm probably doing a really bad explanation of this no 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 worry people can people can research yeah, yes. and look into it yes. it's just uh, uh yeah one um, rabbit yes. hole. Yes, okay, yeah. Please look in the rabbit hole and get the details. Some of LAC have been a really good blog post on that. The name but, um, of that case? Like the um if you look up yeah, A level algorithm. A level, okay. A level, yeah. Ah, a level, um, yes. yes. Yeah. Then, yes, yeah. But then basically the algorithm very clearly, you know, showed all sorts of kind of class discriminations. If you went to a uh a, if you had a class with, I think, less than 20 people in it, you got a predicted grade, I believe, from your teacher, not from the algorithm because it didn't work. And then obviously, if you go to like a private school, you're much more likely to have small class sizes. Um, they also mapped it against, I think the algorithm was based on the achievement of like the previous year. And so mm -hmm. the school kind of demographic had like a huge impact on what those great outcomes would be. And so this led to like massive protests by students, by wow. um, parents, and um, to the extent to which it had to scrap it, right? They had to say, sorry, it doesn't work. Doesn't um, work. Take it back. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this to me, like, you know, I mean, firstly, it just showed these huge class disparities in British society. But secondly, I think it was a really interesting case of where people became super aware super quickly about the kinds of discriminations and biases that are really embedded in some of these tools and mm -hmm. the fact that when they're applied indiscriminately at a scale like this, they result in huge problems. And so I think it was quite a watershed for a particular generation, I hope, of like UK students. Um, but yes, again, please look it up. <laughs> I will know, I will look it up. So <laughs> your hope is yeah. that the, the pushback is yeah. good, starting to happen. I think my hope is that the pushback is starting to happen. And yeah, and also my hope as well is that there's increasingly more and more people going into AI and ML who really genuinely believe in the production of ethical technology. And I'm really inspired by people like Sneha Rivener, who is the head of Encode Justice or the founder of Encode Justice, this UK Justice, okay. yeah, uh, youth advocacy organization. Um, I think she's just started her first year of university, but she started this organization when she was 16 mm -hmm. and her organizing got a bill in California overturned, which would have brought in um, predictive algorithms for sentencing that were shown to be biased against black people mm. um and so she and like kind of all the youth activists who work with her um really believe in the power of gen z to kind of have these more social justice oriented approaches to technology and in doing so kind of have it create an engineering workforce that is more attuned to these ethical issues so those are the things that make me more hopeful, I guess. Good, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, my fears, as I said, are many. Um, I think apart from choose a couple yeah. because yeah. we can do a whole lot. We can do four podcasts yeah, yeah, only yeah. on those four <laughs> questions. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I think I guess I'll focus on I think there's to me really obvious fears around mm -hmm. repression, carcerality, violence, immigration, control and detention. Mm -hmm. Um but I think what I will actually focus on is maybe a more insidious one or a slightly quieter looking problem or two, I guess. And the first is, um, this is something Ellen and I work on a lot, which is the buy-in of what we might call like snake oil products or products that are being mm -hmm. marketed far above their capacities in the companies by people who are super well-meaning and 
you know, who are believing in this marketing, who are buying products that they think are going to work, but actually don't necessarily do what they say on the tin. Uh, and so we look at this particularly in relation to AI hiring tools and we analyze the marketing and the claims that these tools make around being able to de-bias hiring and make hiring fairer. And we kind of question whether or not these tools can actually do that. Um, and so I think, you know, for me, one of my fears is that there isn't enough control over the way that companies are able to market their tools, that there isn't enough awareness of the fact that some of these tools are based on premises that maybe aren't very reflective of like the broader systemic issues that lead to underrepresentation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, I think that fear is one that I think is shared as well by like a lot of people who are computer scientists who work in the AI and ML community that there, it, there is, you know, for as much as there's like really well-designed intentional products out there, there are, there are some products that are, are less so. so that's yeah. one fear. Um, yeah. My other fear um, is to do with, I guess, what some of these products are doing to the ways that we think about race and gender or how they can like encode mm -hmm. certain kinds of categories. Like um, silently encode them. Yeah, or particularly aware around, for example, like data labeling and like I'm multiracial. Mm -hmm. My general experience is that people are not very good at guessing my yeah. ethnicity from the outside, which okay. is obviously, you know, which makes sense because our yeah. racial ethnic identities are very complicated, but that's exactly what yeah, they do. Yeah. 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 Um, is that they will look at a photo of someone and it's often, yeah, they'll decide this person is X. And we, mm -hmm. we know that's not a great way of doing it. Also probably that data was not collected consensually. It was probably stripped off a website. So we're not having an opportunity for self-identification. Mm -hmm. And so I think to me, there's all sorts of ways that different, that these can really entrench categories that like, A, we might not even really believe in or agree with, but also there's so much opportunity for mislabeling and there's mm -hmm. so much opportunity for um, people's identities to be kind of overridden. Um, yeah, and I think I'm also, you know, Michelle Elam at Stanford, I'll just finish with that since it's been very long, um, okay, there's a lot of really interesting work on this in relation to multiraciality, but yes, yeah, so those are some hopes and fears for present AI. Okay, <laughs> on to the future. Yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, I needed two questions. No, <laughs> yeah, 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 we're not going to finish the question. I'm <laughs> sorry. We'll, we'll record more. Um, okay. We yeah, yeah. um, have to do one on a long format. I, I recorded a podcast with a friend. It lasted uh, one time uh, six hours and a half. Wow! So we spoke for we spoke for seven hours, and then he edited it, and it came out six hours and a half. It was a, a great experience. We should do that sometime. Okay. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Be nice. Maybe with you and Eleanor. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you'll probably be very sick of us, but like two hours in, you'll very well. Be very tired. <laughs> Um, but like more time than that, oh, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if there's snacks, I'm there. So yeah. it has to be six hours worth of snacks and then yeah, well, around. Around. You, you take breaks. You take okay. breaks. You pause it. You take breaks. Okay. Like, yeah, it has to be a yeah. difference. This is just Russian. But, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I guess so. It's future hopes and fears AI. Future hopes and fears. Yes. yes. Yeah, I guess like um, my future hopes would be around. AI that is very much designed for and by the people like who use it the most, but also kind of are most likely to experience its harm. So kind of forms of community ownership and community design to try and create technologies that are more just and more sustainable. Mm. Okay. And this is something that my current team is working on. Um, Tom at the center here works specifically on ideas around um, participatory design and trying to have more just and sustainable design practices. It's not something I know as much about, but it's something I'm really interested in going forward. Um, yeah, and I think my hopes is also that we start to find ways to think about technology that are less saturated with these really harmful gendered and racial ideas and stereotypes. So that's something I work on a lot in my own work mm -hmm. um, now, which is trying to think about how anti-Asian racism really shapes a lot of the ways that we think and talk about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of my fears, um, again, they're many and numerous. It's not helped by the fact that we're sitting right now in a room that clearly was used by our other center, the Center for Study of Existential Risk, because it oh. says, what is going to kill us on the whiteboard? So that's wow. nice. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. So, so you share. So the, the center for the future <laughs> the CFI shares uh, the, the same floor with the center for existential risk. 
Uh, yeah, so they're, I think, technically just ah, low ones, but we, yeah. we're kind of like sister centers, so they're like their own thing, but we overlap quite a lot on issues around kind of long term AR. Yeah, that's such a good uh, I don't so know if it's easy to see. So but... kill. They can re really recognize this. Kill. Right, yeah. So, yeah. what is going to kill us? What can we do about it? How do we make sure it gets done? Wow. Yeah, so that's just the kind of general shops that go on here. Buying <laughs> vibe. <you know? laughs> Um, so yeah, that doesn't really help uh, in yeah. cosmic pessimism very much, to be honest. Um, yeah. yeah, and so yeah, so they're good for generating lots of meaningful wow. fears. Uh, Long term, future. yeah. I mean, yeah, no, I think uh, genuinely though, the environmental impact of AI, and again, Amy van Heinsberg yeah. at University of Bonn has kind of a whole lab of thinking about this. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think just the planetary costs, yeah. the labor costs, the real impact that these technologies will have on people's lives, like that, really scares me a lot. Um, then you're really entangled you know, with capitalism in the way, you know. Yeah, like, and just continuous resource extraction, yeah. and continuous labor exploitation. Like, I think in many ways, I think AI can just really exacerbate a lot of those things we already see in other aspects. Inequality, of global inequality. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm very interested yeah. in, in those problems. I want yeah. to work on those problems. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, and I think, you know, Abeba Bahane writes a lot about the algorithmic colonization of Africa. Um, cool. Abeba Bahane. Um, Abeba Bahane. Um, the, colonization, uh, the algorithmic colonization of Africa. Yeah, and she's absolutely amazing. And Michael Quitt writes a lot about digital colonialism. And no, she is, I think she's now at Mozilla. Uh, yeah, and yeah, she's fantastic. Um, yeah, Michael Quitt also writes about this. Karen Howe, the journalist, did a really great series on digital colonialism. Like, I think how AI can just extend previous patterns of colonialism um, and okay, discrimination okay. is also. Very I think scary. Let's leave that's this part. Thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. yeah. Let's leave this part for. I mean, let's keep this. Yes. <laughs> because uh, so we separate. We have ten more minutes. Let oh wow, speak. that did go very fast. Yes, I I might be able. Let me do a quick pause and see. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you and I mean, we both can do a little more because this is yes. too good. Yeah. One no. quick pause. <laughs> Oh, okay, we're back. <laughs> so, as you know, we don't edit, so we're just going to upload however it is. So, uh, unfortunately, we won't have a lot of time, but we can do three more questions. So, what else have you been working on, Carrie? Like, tell us, what else are you doing here? Yeah, I just wrapped up, you literally got to the Good Robot book, and then we just... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just wrapped it. Um, Sorry, yeah, no, so I am, apart from continuing on other work from the Gender and Tech Project, uh, which includes publishing on some of the industry data that Eleanor and I under Professor Jude Brown, our PI, collected over the past two years, working with a big tech company on how AI ethics is getting operationalized on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so still publishing off that. Also, we co-edited with Professor Brown and with Dr. Stephen Cave a book called Feminist AI. Um, and so that'll be coming out next year in nice. March, April 2023, Amazing. which I'm March. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I'm really, really excited it's about it. It's ready. Um, the manuscript's done. We actually had the front cover come out to us uh, uh, last week, and it's beautiful. So exciting. Um, and artist, Stefano Kaimi, um, I'm not, yeah, I'm very sorry if I pronounced your last name wrong, Stefano, who's also an academic, um, did the cover art, and it's stunning. It's like AI generated art based on flowers. Um, oh. It's really beautiful. Nice. Um, so yeah, we're excited. The contributors have been fantastic. Um, and how was the experience? I mean, yeah, I think it's always it's always intimidating and always tricky. I think whenever you say you're like, oh, we're doing a book on feminist AI because wow. there's so many feminisms. There's so many different feminist approaches to like, AI. What, what do you mean by feminism? Yeah, I mean feminism. Yeah. Is, are so multiplicitous and yeah. they're so complex and they're and like the histories of different feminisms are often violent and they're not good on it and so mm -hmm. you know and I really enjoy work by people like Sophie Lewis for example who are like very deliberately trying to say like actually what does it mean if we say like these are that feminisms themselves are often just so violent there's obviously a long history of yeah what does that um, mean as well like feminist thought so woman of color thought that's like been challenging kind mm. of the whiteness of feminism historically and contemporaneously mm. um so yeah so i think these were the kinds of questions we were really grappling with with a book called feminist ai is that how can you be fully representative of the diversity of feminist thought wow. um and also you know we were aware that like you know we are based in the university of cambridge in the global north and so this book is not going to be at all representative, really, of the diversity of feminist thought. So 
Um, I think the thing that I guess I found challenging about that was trying to balance all those different tensions. But for me, it also was just really important to be like, yeah, we've called this book Feminist AI, but it is one book, hopefully, in many, many, many books on the feminist AI. Yeah. Um, and it's also, Minimum. yeah, just offering one starting point in that conversation for thinking about feminist approaches to this work. Um, and also there's been a long history of feminist thinking in AI that will continue to be a long history of feminist thinking and in then AI. You can, you, you can do yeah. another one on the global south, you know, to try and understand, bringing people that, that, that understand that very well, collaborating. I think it's starting the conversation is really important, right? I think so, yeah. And I also just think it's like, you know, for me, even though like a lot of my family comes from the global south, it's just not something I would feel like comfortable doing, like taking a leading role in that conversation. So I think there's just a lot of discussions around positions. Someone else can. Around, yeah, yeah, around, you know, um, how we approach these technologies, which I think is really important to have. Um, And so I think, yeah, that's something that I definitely found complex in that process. Mm. Um, But I'm also like ultimately just like, I think, but all the essays we have and the people who like really generously contributed their scholarship, like they're really cool. So mm-hmm. check out the book and write with many books in a response. We will. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, I, I'm so, uh, what's the word? Humbled from all this. Like you're doing so uh-huh. much great work and so international and so, so much impact. I mean, you should be very proud of yourself. Oh, thank really, you. Really, yeah. Really, yeah. Much, I want to get there someday. No, I mean, I mean, <laughs> I know, I think that's just like my hope is always never like, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, my short term hope is just yet to like spread the word as much as possible about yeah. all the amazing feminist stuff happening in AI um, and all the incredible feminist critiques of AI. But yeah, my long term goal is I want to be like completely irrelevant because I want my scholarship to not be needed. I don't want okay. technology to still be super sexist and super racist yeah. like in 50 years. I yeah, it has to be yeah. logical, clear to everyone that, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the case. Yeah, right? exactly. Like it's just a basic principle. Yeah. Like of course we need these design principles. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's my long-term goal. Good. It's like Good. that to become like, outdated wow. it's, it's an interesting long you know, like, yeah. that's the goal very so we'll cool. see that, cool. that it becomes like second nature mm. you know, any engineer that's going to start designing something like knows this stuff you know, he has to exactly or she yeah. has to yeah, yeah exactly yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so uh and it's in the language as well <laughs> okay so uh Last two questions. These are questions that I always ask everyone that comes to Cloud Conversations. Uh, I also ask them to Noam Chomsky. That was the first one that came to the Cloud Conversation. Yeah, he gave interesting responses. Anyway, so uh, about our knowledge society, about MindShop, right? So this podcast is is part of of MindShop. Uh, Like, I think people these days don't take the time to take care of those trees that take hundreds of years to grow, right? It's a metaphor on on how seriously we take uh, change in the world, right? Like, instead of going quickly, like as soon as possible, how do we do, do those things that will last, will outlive us? And I want MindShop to really outlive me. I've actually thought about who, who will need MindShop after I'm gone. And it's not going to be my, my, my children. It's going to be someone that is interested and deserves it and, and, and will keep it, you know, as, a, as an inheritance. I don't know, internationally inheritance. But uh, many philosophers have gotten in trouble. And I use the, the phrase from Socrates, right? Like Socrates got into the, uh, in the, um, in the apology, right? He fa- very famously died, right? <laughs> Not a spoiler. Because sometimes philosophy and some, um, there are some uncomfortable questions that people don't want for persons to ask. So how could we as a knowledge society stay free from this? How, how could we uh, not get entangled on those uh, politics or, I mean, from the private or the public sector. What tips would you give us as a knowledge society? Gosh, yeah, that's a <laughs> just a light question to end on before lunch. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and there's another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh, yeah, I guess. How do we sort of keep this knowledge sort of free, I guess? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, kind of try to think about, like, how we sustain and grow knowledge over time without you know, without kind of having that. And the person you have agendas. Yeah, I guess um, I always have two answers to that. Like, I guess on the one hand, it's like, I do feel like my work is really normative. And that I said, it's like, yeah, I have like a strong political platform agenda with like what I want to achieve in that work. And, And so like, I think I'm definitely very wary of like painting the work that I do as like apolitical because like, I think, you know, 
all my work is like very fundamentally directed towards social justice, towards creative yes. and technology. And so, yeah, but I do think that that question though of like, how do we try and like continue to grow that research when there's a lot of different competing corporate agendas or things that the university asks us for or things that we, you know, that you're meant to do to succeed in academia. Like, I think there's a lot of competing polls. I guess instinctively one of the things I would say is I think in academia, there's like this really strong sense of like almost you and your work are your own brand. Like you build like a name for yourself and it's like, you know, it's about becoming like a recognizable figure and like starting your kind of schools of thought and having people like cluster around you. And I think this is not a critique of any individual person at all. This is like interesting how I can get this bit of, yeah, how you get tenure, right? When like that just encourages this like total individualization of knowledge and it encourages you, you to come up with a new term and say, I invented this and I did Quite this. Kind of exactly. And I get the, the materials for it. Yeah, and the medals for this. When like we know through citation and we know through like how knowledge sharing production actually works. It's just this is all collective. It's collective. Yeah. And that's something I really love about different kinds of disciplines, like certain work in black studies, nation diaspora studies, is I think there's a real like reverence just in how those works are often constructed and written for people who came before who gave us all this brilliant knowledge you know said so they say you know this person shows us how x and they're building on that in a way that I think doesn't have to be about kind of combativeness or about sort of establishing this kind of individual ownership of knowledge mm. um, and I think if we want to our knowledge to be to be free in a way then we can't keep subscribing to these capitalist models of knowledge ownership because you know, then I think there is like an inbuilt hypocrisy to saying like, yeah. you know, oh, well, we're independent yeah. academics and like we are somehow holier than thou compared to corporations. Yeah. Like, I think hypocrisy is an inevitable part of human life. I'm not saying, I don't think pure integrity is ever possible, mm -hmm. but I also think that like, we maybe need to take a step back and say, okay, but actually, yeah, we're building ourselves through this brand model, like maybe anything Sorry, am I escaping? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was thanks. a very strong answer. <laughs> yes, that, that that view that knowledge comes from uh, an individual and comes from I mean and can be purchased and, and sold and you know and, and unlocked. Yeah, yeah, and again, I understand that again, like it's super alluring. I say that as someone who's in academia and has mm. like a website, you know, all that yeah. stuff. Like, yeah. you, know. you gotta play the game as well, yeah. but you gotta stay uh, with your eyes on on the deep future. Like, what what would be ideal? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Okay. And well, I just think like you know, um, I do just think that the best thing can happen is the conversation, and collaboration, and like. You know, I'm so grateful to academics who do things like share their syllabuses and who make their work and therefore it's easily available and who share that generously, who give opportunities to you. Mm -hmm. um, like, yeah, I think that kind of spirit is okay. really crucial. Thank you very much. And then the second one is much more like uh, future. Like imagine, uh, imagine we, we, we do this, right? Like mine should last for 200 years, I don't know, 400 years. There's, well... Uh, where we're at, it's 800 years old, right? Like University of Cambridge. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm not comparing it. I'm just like, you know, but there are some societies, for example, the Aristotelian Society in, in London, uh, they've been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going for something like that. So let's say that happens. Uh, and imagine this is like a message in a bottle for the future. You know, yes. someone will see this in like 300 years, okay? 400 years. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to those people about knowledge and understanding and improving the world. Gosh. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> You're talking to like a future human or, or something else. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this and then you will add to it. It was about my original thought was don't get three mobile if you're moving <laughs> don't get three mobile. It doesn't work. Shout out to all students. Do not get three mobile. Okay, Bridge. <laughs> It doesn't work. I don't care how long it works, wow. but it still never works. I hope it doesn't exist, yeah. but it really exists. <laughs> don't get uh, I'll, I'll get that too. Yeah. I think it's I'll get three more, and I was like, no, that's just what I like, did not do. Um, okay, <laughs> more seriously. Um, this is going to be really ironic because I've just talked for like an hour and 15 minutes straight. No, this is a podcast. <laughs> Um, I do just think that like I think listening is just like the key component of 
so much learning um, and listening to people really meaningfully and seriously and allowing people to kind of tell the stories the way they want to. And that doesn't mean that you have to believe the exact narrative people always tell you, like as an academic or a scholar, like, you know, you're in your right to critically examine and think through, but um, always allowing yourself to listen, I think um, it's just so crucial because I think often we jump straight to critique either um, and we jump straight to trying to find the holes in the argument or trying to find, you know, the problems. And I think there's all sorts of, you know, people like Spivak and Rawls who have been really intentional about talking to their students around kind of really generous reading and ensuring that, you know, you're trying to understand where someone's coming from first and foremost and how the argument is constructed before you immediately go into the unpicking. Assuming, um, yeah, and I think there's something quite beautiful in that kind of like intellectual like generosity and that kind of humility. Um, so that would be, I think, my whole word. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I, I finish this with the feeling that, I, I mean, I would love to keep going, but we'll do more, we'll do more. Uh, okay. Thank yeah. you very much, Karen. Um, thank you. No, thank you. And, and congratulations on all your work. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.